I was born here in Miami Beach. I know that's where most people die. Really, everyone's all there. They didn't even have facilities for me at the hospital. I was born in a broken hip ward. This isn't me. This is me. Not very attractive. I had very bad buck teeth. I used to eat other kids' candy bars by accident. This is my dad, the most overcautious, overprotective parent in the world. Let him tell you why I never went to nursery school. I took her to the school. I looked in, and the kids were running around with pencils, with the points facing straight up. Sharpened, I said, forget this crap. My mother always wanted to be a dancer, but my grandfather wouldn't let her. He said it wasn't a classy profession, and he would know because he was a night watchman. My mom took me to ballet class when I was very young. I wasn't very good. In Swan Lake, I was the lifeguard. But I stuck with it, and through diligence and hard work, became mediocre. Eventually, I switched to jazz. I just didn't agree with the concept of ballet and standing on your toes. You know, dancing's hard enough. You don't have to start eliminating parts of your feet. It was at this stage that I tried to cultivate an image. There was... Priscilla Rudner, Diana Rigg Rudner, and of course, Flipper Rudner. I settled on the natural look, minus some eyebrows, and when I was 15, left Miami to seek fame and fortune in a great white way. I was lucky and landed a job almost immediately, a national tour of Zorba the Greek. First stop, Miami. My Broadway debut was in Promises, Promises at the Schubert Theater on West 44th Street. I can't believe this is me. It's another life. I feel like Shirley MacLaine, only I have pictures. Dancing was getting a little old, and so was I. And while I was in Annie, it occurred to me that George Burns was still working, and Gene Kelly hadn't had a job in quite some time. I'd always secretly been interested in comedy, and I decided to give stand-up a try at the club across the street from the theater. I liked it. No one told me what to do, no uncomfortable costumes, and you could still do it when you were old and it didn't hurt. Well, at least not physically. I left Annie, and after a year of experimenting and learning in New York clubs, I got a big break here on HBO. This was my very first TV appearance on a show celebrating the 10th anniversary of the New York Comedy Club Catch a Rising Star. I'm easy to spot. I'm the one who's not famous. I did three more HBO specials, became a regular on The Tonight Show and Late Night with Letterman, and that, Simon, is exactly how I got here. I hope that answers your question. Oh, yeah. No. What I really meant was, how did you get here? I mean, Steve, you know, the house manager, he says that he saw you on the bus, and then Arnie thinks that you took a cab, but I said that HBO would have sprung for a limo. From the Ohio Theater, it's Born to be Mild, starring... Rita Rudner. Please welcome Rita Rudner. It's very exciting to be here. I can't believe how fast the time goes, though. I mean, my last special, I just got married. And now we just celebrated our second anniversary. Oh, thank you, yes. <laughs> Applause for two years. Thank you very much. <laughs> Most places, people aren't that impressed, you know. <laughs> I say I've been married for two years. People say, good. Um, <laughs> Except, of course, in Hollywood, when I say, I've been married for two years, and people say, what's your secret? <laughs> there, a marriage is a success if it outlasts milk. 
<laughs> it's a terrible place, Hollywood. It is, don't go. When you meet a guy there, the first question you ask yourself is, I don't know. Is this the man I want my children to spend their weekends with? <laughs> But things are going very well with us. My husband, um, he gave me this necklace for our anniversary. It's fake. And <laughs> I requested fake. I did, because maybe I'm paranoid, but in this day and age, I just don't want anything around my neck that's worth more than my head. deposit box but since I don't have any good jewelry I keep something else in there that means quite a lot to me I made this omelet once that flipped over perfectly <laughs> I can't believe we're in the 1990s already either Boy, the 90s are a very special decade for me because they're my last fertile decade and I still don't know what to do. My husband and I, we've been discussing it so far. We're either going to get a dog or have a child. <laughs> we haven't quite decided if we want to ruin our carpet or ruin our lives. <laughs> and it gets harder to have children when you get older. Not only having them, but naming them. Because by the time you're in your 30s, every name you think of reminds you of someone you hate. <laughs> we have to hurry. We're down to Jethro and Nefertiti. <laughs> and I'm an only child. I don't have any idea about babies. I was over at my friend's house, and her baby was crying. Well, not really crying, more screaming. <laughs> I've never heard a noise quite like this was a mating call to a car alarm. <laughs> and I just asked my friend, the baby's what, a month old? What could be that wrong? <laughs> it hasn't been outside yet. <laughs> she said, he's hungry. I thought that's the noise he makes when he's hungry? He better pace himself. <laughs> what kind of noise is he going to make when he gets audited? <laughs> and all my friends have children, every one of them, and they all tell me what they go through. It's scary. One of my friends told me she was in labor for 36 hours. I know. I don't even want to do anything that feels good for 36 hours. <laughs> Kangaroos have a good deal. I like that pouch set up. I'd have a baby if it would mature in a handbag. <laughs> and I'm always going to all these big birthday parties that my friends make for their kids. One of my friends made a great big surprise party for her child. He's one. <laughs> we all snuck in around the crib. We jumped up, we all surprised! He was surprised. He's in therapy. I had the worst birthday party ever when I was a child because my parents hired a pony to give rides. And these ponies are never in good health. But this one dropped dead. It just wasn't much fun after that. One kid would sit on him and the rest of us would drag him around in a <laughs> But I always think the worst things, you know, like I was asking my friend who has children, what if I have a baby and I dedicate my life to it and it grows up and it hates me? and it blames everything that's wrong with its life on me. And my friend said, oh, Rita, don't be silly. What do you mean, what if? <laughs> you just never know what type of 
those styles you're getting, they have their own personalities immediately. I was watching little kids on a carousel, teeny little kids. Some kids were jumping on the horses, some kids were afraid of the horses, some kids were betting on the horses. <laughs> and I wouldn't want a kid who was like me, because I was just so shy when I was growing up. Well, worse than shy, I was boring. <laughs> I was, whenever we played doctor, the other children always made me the anesthesiologist. <laughs> Really, all I had were two friends, and they were imaginary. <laughs> and they would only play with each other. <laughs> I was nice, though, I was. I was the only one in my class who would seesaw with the fat kids. <laughs> but we didn't really seesaw, though. We kind of just seed. <laughs> I'd get on, and then she'd get on. Then the fire department would get me out of the tree. <laughs> you know, it was a very, very tricky time for me, Halloween, because all my life, my parents said, never take candy from strangers. And then they dressed me up and said, now go beg for it. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, really. I'd knock on people's doors, I'd go, trick or treat. No, thank you. <laughs> My parents were great, though. They never wanted me to be upset about anything. They couldn't tell me when a pet had died. I remember once I woke up and my goldfish was gone. And I said, Mom, where's Fluffy? <laughs> She said he ran away. <laughs> it was embarrassing. I offered a reward. My friends were stupid. They looked for him. <laughs> Whenever anything went wrong in my life, when my mom always had the same saying. She'd say over and over, all things happen for the best. And I'd always say, who's best? And she'd say, gotta go. <laughs> There's really only one way to describe my mother. There's a very old saying, I don't know if you've heard it. Neurotics build castles in the air and psychotics live in them. Yes? Well, my mother cleans them. <laughs> my dad's a good guy. He's smart. Well, he's too smart. When you're too smart, it goes around in a little circle and gets stupid again. Because he's absent-minded. You know, he used to do things like when I was a little kid, he'd throw me up in the air and answer the phone. <laughs> and he's a doctor with the worst handwriting. And don't they all have horrible handwriting? How does anyone ever know what they mean? He wrote me a note once excusing me from gym class. I gave it to my teacher. She gave me all of her money. <laughs> My mom's been nagging my dad to take up a sport, so he just did, he took up bird watching. He's very serious about it, really. He bought binoculars and a bird. <laughs> my parents have a very good marriage, though. They've been together forever. They've passed their gold and silver anniversaries. Their next one is Rust. <laughs> My mom's always trying to figure out new ways to keep excitement in their marriage. She took up belly dancing once in order to make it appear like she was moving my dad and I had to jiggle the furniture in back of her. <laughs> for me about how to stay married for a long time though she said always remember honesty is very important it must be avoided <laughs> and the most important thing is you have to let your husband be himself and you have to pretend he's someone else <laughs> I love 
being married. I really do. It's so great to find that one special person that you want to annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> I made a terrible mistake on our honeymoon, though. You know what I did? I beat my husband at tennis on our honeymoon. I, I just came right out afterwards and asked him, are we ever going to have sex again? <laughs> and he said yes, but not with each other. <laughs> My husband's from England, and um, I watched a football game with him once, and that was lots of fun, because he's from England, so he had never seen a football game before. So I could tell him anything I wanted. <laughs> I told him it was over at halftime. <laughs> a lot to England. Uh, in fact, we were there last 4th of July. Not a big holiday there. <laughs> They're still a little testy. <laughs> and I have a friend who's originally from Brooklyn who moved to London 10 years ago and it was so strange because I called her up and she used to talk like this. And now she talks like this. <laughs> of course, she slips every once in a while. She said, oh, you must come over for a spot of coffee. <laughs> I'd love for you to meet my husband, Vincent. Your dinner! <laughs> We had a terrible problem with immigration. We had to wait six months for my husband to get an appointment for an interview for a green card. And we went down to the immigration building and we had to prove we were married and we'd forgotten our marriage certificate. I looked at him, I said, I thought you brought it. He said, I thought you brought it. I said, I took it out of the filing cabinet and put it next to your keys. He said, well, why didn't you continue the thought and take it on into the car? And the lady said, oh, forget it, you're married. <laughs> I was single for a very long time. I was, before I met my husband, I'd never fallen in love. I'd stepped in it a few times. <laughs> I was always meeting men who weren't right for me. That's why I feel that after you've dated someone, it should be legal to stamp them with what's wrong with them. <laughs> so the next person doesn't have to start from scratch. didn't want to get involved. That's what was happening. I dated one guy for about two years. Finally, I just gave him an ultimatum. I said, listen, either you tell me your name or it's over. <laughs> you know how I used to end relationships? I'd never say, this isn't working out or I don't want to see you anymore. If I never wanted to see a man again, I'd just say, you know, I love you. <laughs> I want to marry you. I want to have your children. Sometimes they'd leave skid marks. <laughs> the worst thing about breaking up with someone was always when they wanted to stay your friend. Why do they want to do that? Why can't they get lost? <laughs> this one guy used to call me up all the time I'd say, look, I don't have anything to tell you He'd say, just tell me the same things you tell your friends So I told him how horrible he was <laughs> I do think men should be married though Because men don't live well by themselves They don't they don't even live like people. <laughs> they live like bears with furniture. <laughs> I know, I used to go over to my husband's cave. 
nothing on the wall, except for some food. <laughs> the frost was so thick in the freezer, you couldn't close the door. The apartment door. <laughs> the roaches in his kitchen had stopped eating. <laughs> they were full. <laughs> They were on the counter doing aerobic exercise. <laughs> I can't describe the bathroom to you. <laughs> it was too disgusting. But I'll try. <laughs> no, all I have to say about men in bathrooms is they're not real specific. <laughs> If they hit something, they're happy. <laughs> Not that I'm good domestically at all around the house. I hate anything like that. I hate doing laundry. I don't separate my colors from my whites. I put them together. I let them learn from their cultural differences. <laughs> cook. I hate cooking. I'm feeling guilty, so I bought one of those slow cookers, and I'm making dinner now for the year 2000. <laughs> they have different settings, fast, medium, and slow. I have it on Mosey. <laughs> I've been reading recipes. I think that's the start. You know, I've been reading baking recipes, though, and they scare me, because I don't know what a lot of those ingredients are. What is cream of tartar? I hope it's not what I think it is. <laughs> and how come when you mix water and flour together, you get glue? And then you add eggs and sugar and you get cake. <laughs> Where does the glue go? <laughs> I spend sleepless nights worrying about baking soda. Do you know about baking soda? It can do anything. It puts out fires. You can brush your teeth with it. It's a deodorant. It's an antacid. Is it civil? <laughs> we do go out to eat a lot in restaurants. My favorite are Chinese restaurants. I love Chinese food. I have my own chopsticks. They have my initials on the top and Velcro on the bottom. <laughs> we both gained weight after we got married, so we went on diets together. Isn't that cute? Well, he started to lose weight, and I didn't. I had to feed him in his sleep intravenously. <laughs> but my whole family, we've, we've always had a weight problem. My dad is waiting to buy new clothes till he loses weight, so he's still wearing his Cub Scout uniform. <laughs> and I've been trying to get my husband to exercise, but he hates it. He says he's good at water sports, but I don't feel it's a water sport. Shaving. <laughs> and he's not good at it. He's not. He goes into the bathroom. He's a man with a slight stubble. He comes out of the bathroom. He's a victim of a shark attack. <laughs> and he uses an electric razor. <laughs> now, I swim because it's very good exercise and it's hard to hurt yourself. <laughs> They're bathing suits that had feet. <laughs> we go into these little cells with mirrors every place and the very cruel lighting. So we can see exactly what's wrong with our body from every conceivable angle. I think after you leave those rooms, they should offer you some type of counseling. <laughs> or, thank you. Or at least have a sticker on the mirror that says, caution, objects in the mirror may appear larger. <laughs> and 
I exercise and I still don't look anything like those women in Playboy. I think they get them from other planets. I hope so, I don't want them here. <laughs> this one girl I saw, she was amazing. And I don't think she had silicone. I think she had helium. <laughs> she was so big I couldn't keep the magazine closed. <laughs> And my old boyfriend used to say, I read Playboy for the articles. I used to say, right, I go to shopping malls for the music. <laughs> I do like shopping malls. I have to confess that to you. Well, I'm very at home in them because my mother lost me in a mall when I was very young. <laughs> And I was raised by saleswomen. <laughs> They're making malls so big now, aren't they? There are trees in them and birds. Birds live in the mall. They do. It must be a strange life for them, don't you think? When going south for the winter means flying over to Sears. <laughs> One time I used to love to shop was after a bad relationship. I'd go and I'd buy a new outfit. It would just make me feel better. In fact, sometimes if I'd see a really great outfit, I'd break up with someone on purpose. <laughs> Once I saw a great outfit and I wasn't dating anyone. So I went up and hugged a stranger and slapped him and bought it. <laughs> the cliche is true though. Men like cars and women like clothes. I only like cars because they take me to clothes. <laughs> I went into this one dress shop. It was very exclusive. I didn't know how exclusive it was. I walked in and I didn't know you had to call ahead before you went there. I went in, the salesman looked at me and said, do you have an appointment? I said, no. Do the dresses have something else to do today? <laughs> I do spend too much money on clothes. My last credit card bill was so big before I opened it, I actually heard a drum roll. <laughs> I used to worry about not paying my bills, but then, then I read about chapter 11. <laughs> do you know about chapter 11? You don't have to pay anyone off and you don't go to jail. What's chapter 12, run like hell? But women, we spend lots of money on clothes because our whole identities are wrapped up in what we wear. You never see a man go into a party and say, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Quick, get me out of here before someone sees me. There's another man wearing a black tuxedo. They're happy if they all look alike. It means they haven't made a mistake. <laughs> and I'm not being sexist because men just don't have the patience for shopping. They don't. That's why in department stores, the men's department is always on the first floor, two inches from the door. <laughs> My husband likes to help me pick out my clothes, though. He wanted me to try on a leather dress. He thought they were sexy. I showed him. <laughs> I never had a leather dress on before. You know, it wasn't until then that I realized how uncomfortable cows must be. <laughs> That moo is really a cry for help. <laughs> and he tried to make me not get this dress. I really wanted one. So you know how he did it? He said, okay, buy it if you want, but it reminds me of the kind of thing my old girlfriend used to like. I bought it just so she couldn't have it. <laughs> I 
I never know what to buy for other people, though. I'm bad at that. I've given up on my father. Last year, on his birthday, I just gave him $100 and said, buy yourself something that will make your life easier. So he went out and bought a present for my mother. <laughs> my mom's good at that. She gave us the most beautiful wedding present. It was this plant that she'd grown from a seedling. She's so good at this. She gave it to me. It was this big, blooming, beautiful bush. Two weeks with me, and it was a corsage. <laughs> I have no talent in that direction. I've killed so many plants. I walked into a plant nursery once and my face was on a wanted poster. <laughs> and I never know what to get for my husband. Last Christmas, I, well, first of all, I should tell you, I'm Jewish, but I celebrate Christmas. And I'm going to do that till the Jewish people can decide on a way to spell Hanukkah. <laughs> And we were never religious. We always had a Christmas tree. But if any of my religious friends came over, we'd say, it's not a Christmas tree. It's a Hanukkah bush, right? And they'd say, well, well all right then. Who's that in the manger? <laughs> we'd say, hi, me. say, and who are those three men standing behind him? We'd say, his lawyers. <laughs> so last Christmas, I did something I thought was so clever, because my husband likes massages. I booked a masseuse to come to the house. Wasn't that a good idea? Yes, I thought so too, till the doorbell rang and I opened it, and there was an 18-year-old blonde girl standing there. And she said, I'm here to give your husband a massage. And I said, he's dead. <laughs> you just get more confident when you're married. You think differently. When you're single and you don't hear from your boyfriend, you think, should I call him? When you're married and you don't hear from your husband, you think, what should I call him? <laughs> My husband's gotten more relaxed, too, though. He's become the worst hypochondriac. I bought him one of those thermometers that, that you wear on your head that changes colors. Have you seen those? He loves it. He bought shoes to match. <laughs> he doesn't get headaches anymore, my husband. He gets brain tumors. And he won't go to the doctor. He'll just ask me, what do you think I should take for a brain tumor? <laughs> I give him baking soda. <laughs> we just got a new house in Los Angeles. We moved, oh, we made so many mistakes. First thing we did, we hired the vegetarian moving company. They were too weak to lift anything. <laughs> we got something my husband always wanted, an electric garage door. I guess it's a feeling of power. Because he drives up the driveway, he presses the clicker, the garage door opens halfway. <laughs> presses the clicker again and it closes. $600, we need a car that can limbo. <laughs> I always thought one of the really great things about being married and living in a house was that if you were asleep and you heard a noise in the backyard, you'd have someone there to protect you. Someone who would run to the closet and grab a gun and go to the window and say, get off my land, I'll blow your head off. Well, my husband's English, so it was a little different. We were asleep. And we heard a noise in the backyard, and my husband ran to the closet and grabbed his dressing gown. <laughs> Went to the window and said, Hello? <laughs> I said, really scare him. Invite him in for some tea. <laughs> so, of course, I 
I had to be the heavy. I had to be the one to deal with the workmen around the house because nothing was finished when we moved in. And I didn't know, but sometimes workmen can have real attitudes. They can. The painter came in. I was very nice. I said, um, could you fill in some of these holes before you start, please? He looked at me and said, lady, I don't spackle. I don't sand, I don't tape. I just paint. Then the exterminator came in. I said, kill the painter. <laughs> And we had mice in the basement. I had to go get this jar of poison to put down there. Well, you know, everything comes with this tamper-resistant seal on it now. The tamper-resistant seal had been broken. I didn't know whether or not to buy the poison. <laughs> Such a strange world. Someone could have slipped some aspirin in there. And we did some remodeling, and that's when I learned the most dangerous word in the English language. You know what it is? It's not a murder, or mortgage, or cholesterol. The most dangerous word in the English language is estimate. <laughs> when anyone says estimate to you, just run. And don't look back, because estimate basically means Chapter 11. <laughs> and I had to try to decorate the house, and I'm not qualified. What do I know about decorating? You know, I'm a comedian. I've been living in motels on the road for six years. My living room, I have two double beds in it. I've nailed my lamp to my dresser. You know what I never knew? I've never known how high to hang a picture. So I asked someone, and you know what they said? Eye level. My husband's 6'2", and I'm 5'6". We have two hooks, depending on who's home. <laughs> and I don't know if I want to put a fuzzy cover on my toilet seat. I've been trying to decide. I know I want to meet whoever invented them. I want to see who looked at a toilet and thought, that needs a hat. <laughs> we don't argue too much, my husband and I. We have, well, I have a bad memory for phone numbers. That's one of the things we fight about. But I have a problem with phone numbers. I don't think that if you're just one digit off, you should get a whole other person. If you're that close, you should at least get someone who knows where they are. <laughs> and our other argument is how long it takes to get ready to go out. Yes, because this is how he goes out. I'm going out. Come on, come on. I have things I have to do to myself before I leave the house. In front of the man I want to attract, I can look disgusting. In front of people I'm never going to see again, I have to look my best. <laughs> so my husband has this new strategy. He says, okay, I'll be waiting for you in the car. He thinks this is going to make me hurry up. <laughs> this just leaves me time to call my friends. <laughs> because he's happy in his car because he loves his car he does he has a special relationship with it it makes noises that only he can hear <laughs> we'll be driving along in the street and he'll say there there's the rattle you hear it and I don't hear it I want to hear it. I try to hear it. Once I lied and said I heard it. 
He said, no, that's not it. <laughs> and, and he likes to wait till the last second to put gas in the car, and it drives me crazy. Once we were driving along, we were so low on gas, I didn't know what to do. I, I turned off the radio. <laughs> And my car has what I thought was an optional feature, but I guess it's a standard because it was on my last car too. It has a rotating gas tank. Whatever side of the pump I pull up onto, it's on the other side. <laughs> And I hate self-service gas stations so much. You know, I'll pay my own bills, I'll open my own doors. Don't make me pump my own gas. It's awful. I was all dressed up once going to this formal affair and ran out of gas and I had to pull over and it was all self-service. I was standing there in the middle of the night in an evening gown, pumping gas. I looked like the gas fairy. <laughs> And when my husband and I were in the car together, I usually let him drive. Because when I drive, he has a tendency to bite the dashboard. Because <laughs> I haven't been driving that long, so I'm still nervous when people honk at me. Unless I'm making a left turn, then I like it. Because that's how I know it's time to turn. <laughs> I drive slowly, and I'll admit that I do once I actually got behind someone who drove more slowly than I did. We began to back up. <laughs> and of course, he likes to go fast. You know, his car goes from zero to 60 in 10 seconds. That makes him happy. I just don't know why he'd ever want to do that. Maybe someday he'll find an open stretch of road and play frisbee with himself. <laughs> When we go on trips, I get two jobs in the car. These jobs could sound familiar to the women in the audience. I get to read the map, yeah. and I get to get out and ask for directions after we get lost. Because he panics when we get lost. I've never seen anything like it, you know? I do, he thinks we make a wrong turn, we're not going to get back to our life. <laughs> Somebody's moved into our house and is wearing his thermometer. <laughs> I never panic when I get lost, I just change where it is that I want to go. <laughs> and he puts so much pressure on me, I think that's why I make mistakes. We'll be driving along and go, okay, which way do we go? Quick, come on, quick. East or west, come on. I can't do everything. I say, I don't know, it looks like we go up. <laughs> we do get really lost though, I have to say. We were driving in Europe. You don't go down the wrong street in Europe. You go in the wrong country. <laughs> we were in Germany, driving in Germany, and all of a sudden everyone was French and we didn't know why. We thought we'd found a fancy part of Germany. I'll tell you what happened so this doesn't happen to you. I thought they were toll booths and they were the border. Yes, and the guard stopped us. But I guess that'll happen when you throw quarters at them. I think my worst map reading mistake was when I insisted there was a bridge over this body of water and it turned out to be the L in lake. <laughs> my husband was stopping strangers on the street saying, how old would you be before you knew this wasn't a bridge? <laughs> That 
That's another reason I'm afraid of having children. I don't know about his temperament. He's not a real patient person. He's already told me he's never changing a diaper, which worries me because I leave town for a week at a time. <laughs> And of course, we've been discussing a nanny, but he's been lobbying for a young Swedish exchange student. And I'm kind of leaning more towards a heavy set woman from one of the Baltic states. <laughs> Is there anyone in the front I can talk to who's had a child who's going to make me feel better about the whole experience? Anyone? Oh, there you are. Oh, what's your name? Diane, and Diane's a beautiful blonde woman, too. I suffer from something, Diane, I have to tell you, paroxophemophobia. <laughs> Every time I've ever gotten near a beautiful blonde woman, something of mine has disappeared. You know, jobs, boyfriends. Once an Angora sweater leaped right off my body. <laughs> so, Diane, how many children? You have two children, and they're here with you tonight. You're a close family. We're not. That must be nice. Once every five years, we have a family picnic. Wherever we all are, we eat outside. <laughs> now the question, Diane, did you have natural childbirth? No, thank you, Diane. <laughs> I'm not going to either. I'm not Danielle Boone. To me, natural childbirth is backwards. Everyone takes drugs nowadays except when they need them. <laughs> I have a friend who's having real problems because she's pregnant and her husband wants to have natural childbirth and she doesn't. So he's been going to those classes by himself. <laughs> Did you breastfeed? Well, think back. <laughs> well, I'm not going to. It's for the kids' health, though, really, because I've put this off so long, I'm sure my milk has expired. <laughs> Is this your husband, Diane? Yes, and what's your name? Neil. Neil, did you go into the room with Diane when, when she had a baby? No, thank you, Neil, because men are getting real into that now, and I'm not sure that they're, they're so helpful in there. Well, my friend's husband went in and, and took movies. He brought the video camera in. I just don't know when you'd want to watch these movies. <laughs> when Freddy Krueger isn't quite scary enough? And I asked my husband if he'd be in the room with me, you know what he said. It would have to be a big room. <laughs> and there would have to be a bar at one end. <laughs> but that's how men participate. Now they come into the room with you and they say, breathe. <laughs> Is that really sharing the experience? If I ever have a baby, I want my husband on the table next to me. At least getting his legs waxed. <laughs> One bikini wax, he'd be dead. been putting so much pressure on me to have a child. My grandmother keeps asking me, when am I going to be a great-grandmother? And I keep asking her, why, if I have a baby, do you become great? <laughs> I don't follow the logic. I have a baby, she's great, my mother's grand, and I'm grounded. <laughs> And my parents came to visit us, and they always give me a hard time about it. Well, the first thing that happened when my mother walked into the house, she looked around and said, 
where's the plant? I said, it ran away. And then, of course, she started it on Where's My Grandchild? She wants a child, a grandchild so badly, she does. She started to bribe me. She said, what can I give you to make you have a child? I said, you wait here. I'll write you up an estimate. <laughs> I just don't know, though, if I'd be a good mother. I mean, those tough questions kids ask. What would I say when my kid came to me and asked me, Mom, why is my name Nefertiti? <laughs> I guess I'd say, son. <laughs> I met a painter named Jethro. <laughs> Why is grandma belly dancing? And why does grandpa wear a Cub Scout uniform? Why doesn't daddy have any hair on his legs? I guess I'd say, all things happen for the best. <laughs> Gotta go. Thank you very, very much for coming. Good night. Thank you for watching my special. I hope it made you laugh. And if it didn't, what the hell do I have to do? It's cable, I'm swearing. I'm trying to use the medium. Anyway, here's something from 1976 that I think might amuse you. You watch. I'll cringe. Yogurt will never be the same again. Introducing sweet and low non-fat yogurt with no artificial sweeteners. It has a hundred less calories here. And that's a hundred calories that can't go here. New Sweet Low Yogurt. A hundred less calories per cup than the leading fruit yogurt. With delicious fruit taste. New Sweet Low Yogurt. Who needs a hundred extra calories? Good night. <laughs>